Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. Think Tech Hawaii, I'm Jay Fidel. It's a given Monday at uh, 12 noon. Uh, it's uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge with our, um, our contributor, if you will, Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us from Hilo, Hawaii. Am I right about that? Or are you off in Jan, Marco? I'm here in uh, beautiful Hilo, wishing you assalamu alaikum. Uh, may the peace of the prophets and all good people past, present, and future be upon you, my friend. Well, you know, you, you talk about Afghanistan. I know you're talking about Afghanistan. And, and um, you know, it's a, kind of a failed state, but there are many failed states around the world, more failed states now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. And the question is, uh, do we, on a parallel basis, do we have failed states in this country? And the answer is, in a relative sense, yes, we do. And uh, if we had more time on the show, I would name them for you. OK, the failed states of the United States. It's, it's a different thing. And, and I'm thinking about writing a piece on it anyway, Marco. So let's talk about Hawaiian Electric. Um, you wanted to talk about them because there were interesting news items about them. Am I, am I right about that? It is never ending interesting news items from our friends, our brothers and sisters at Hawaiian Electric, Hawaiian Electric Industries, Helco, Hiko, Miko. So, yeah, I mean, you and I haven't been together now for uh, a number of weeks so thank you so much for having me back on and uh yeah where shall we start well you know back in the day there was all this criticism of wine electric and it seemed like uh, every activist organization everybody was attacking wine electric it wasn't that many years ago uh, uh, over a myriad of things it, it was like mm, pinata time and and somewhere in that period it, of course everything is a sine curve and human history, uh, in that period, it stopped. It, it relaxed, it um, declined, and there wasn't so much criticism. And you could say that um, somehow they had survived it and they had come out smelling pretty good. And people liked wine electric. And you know, I think some of the things that have happened in the past year or two uh, over COVID, um, for example, um, you know, their um, um, termination rules, which I guess did come from the, the PUC about not terminating people who were delinquent in payment during COVID, um, you know, that, that endeared them, at least to some people. And so if you ask me right now today, this moment, what, what is their, you know, image in the community? What is their, uh, you know, likes versus dislikes? I would say that a lot of people like them. But uh, some of the news, you know, and maybe it portents of other events that will take place later, you know, maybe it's a leading indicator kind of thing, um, are the things that you want to talk about. So why don't we talk about those things? Sure, sure, sure. Kind of where to start. I mean, I'm not going to try to maybe take a tape down, a tape down, a top down approach. You know, I've been a, I've been a uh, reader of the tea leaves there at Hawaiian Electric now for more than 20 years and have had a chance to get to know a number of people at the, uh, I'll call them the top echelons of power there over the years. And they're all, they're all very good people, you know, this, uh, uh, and I mean that unequivocally. And, you know, it starts at the top and flows its way down. And I think, uh, you know, at the very top of Hawaiian Electric Industries is uh, Connie Lau. And Connie came from uh, ASB, American Savings Bank, and she was chosen to succeed uh, a white guy, uh, Bob Clark, Robert Clark, in uh, 2006, May 2006, if memory serves. So Connie is now, you know, into year 16, you know, it's top of HEI. And I really, and I mean this most sincerely, I give Connie a tremendous amount of respect and credit for taking the company, you know, into the well into the 21st century. And she, she's done a fantastic job, you know, through the the, the failed attempt to, uh, to merge or to be acquired by uh, Next Era Energy, which took about three years of their bandwidth and time from roughly 2014 you know, into 2017 uh, after the PUC turned down in mid 2016 to kind of unravel that. And the companies have, have braved uh, rather uh, sometimes critical audits. Uh, I'm thinking May of last year, there was a management audit of HECO that uh, was rather hard hitting at times. And they have dealt with a public utilities commission under Dr. Jay Griffin and Jenny and Leo, which has been more, in my opinion, more uh, proactive and more aggressive at times, progressive, maybe that's the better word, progressive. And 
They've also, Hawaiian Electric Industries has uh, fended off uh, various suitors, uh, some friendly and some not so friendly in their eyes. And I'm thinking in particular, uh, Jeff Ubbin at Value Act Capital made a play on Hawaiian Electric several years ago. And this is all public information. It's not as if I'm sharing confidential insider, st insider stuff. And uh, Ubbin's company rose to become at one point earlier this year, the number three shareholder in Hawaiian Electric Industries holding hundreds of millions of dollars worth of their stock only behind uh, BlackRock, uh, Vanguard and BlackRock, who are two Mondo players in the world stage. And Jeff was able to get one or more of, quote, his people on the board, on the HEI board. And, you know, over the past months, uh, there have been two departures from the HEI board. One was Eva Zlotnicka, and, you know, full disclosure, I know Eva. I'm, I'm very, very respectful and, and admire Eva as a, uh, as a professional, as a person. And uh, she left the board uh, because of, of Value Acts and the successor company, Inclusive Capital Partners, their holdings went below a certain threshold in terms of percentage wise. And as per prior agreement, uh, Eva submitted her resignation to the board and that resignation was accepted. This is back in May. So Eva left the board and now more recently, Mary Powell, who I also know personally, who I also think very, very highly of Mary Powell, has recently left the HEI board to, uh, to move on to become the new CEO of Sunrun, which is the largest uh, residential solar developer in the country. She wasn't there that long. She came from a power company, what, in New Hampshire? Um, she, and it she, looked like a pretty good, um, a pretty good addition to the Hawaiian Electric uh, board. I thought so, I thought so. And, um, and the point of fact, Larry, uh, Mary was longtime CEO of Green Mountain Power Green Mountain Power in Vermont and Green Mount, Mountain Power in Vermont had developed a reputation under Mary and, and subsequent as well being a real innovator, very progressive little utility there on the East Coast. So uh, like I said, Mary left the HEI board uh, just recently. So now we're down to eight. We're down to eight board members. And uh, you know, at some point they'll they'll find another one or two. And you know, there's been discussion uh, uh, kind of behind the, the, the scenes, so to speak, about uh, Connie's continued tenure at HEI. That's the plan, wh whether there is a plan. Uh, the timing of the plan is unknown to me. It's not public. But I mean, at some point after 15 plus years, it's reasonable to assume that there has been succession planning going on. You know, who comes after her and, you know, whoever does come after her, because it's not a question of, uh, of if, but when, you know, they'll have some big, uh, Big slippers to fill because Connie has truly done a fantastic job, and uh, the environment in which you know she started her career at, at top of HEI uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, you know, is very it's very different now. So I really do sincerely take my hat off to to what she's been able to do, what the company uh, has has been able to do through thick and thin, through a very different regulatory environment, ever changing political environment, very different geopolitical environment. So. Uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll let you respond. Okay. Well, uh, you know, full disclosure, uh, um, on and off, uh, Hawaiian Electric has been uh, an underwriter for uh, not right now, but an underwriter for uh, ThinkTech. And full disclosure on your side of the of the of the fence, uh, um, you're the founder and CEO of uh, the Hawaii Island uh, uh, Energy Co-op, uh, which um, you know wants to have transactional relations with. HEI or Hawaiian Electric. I, I don't know where that is right now, but you're in, in, a, in the same business, if you will. Um, so you know, the question is, uh, where, where does it go from here? I mean, this is pretty complex. At the same time, this is the, what, am I right? The largest company in Hawaii. It has, what, 2,500 employees. Um, it, is, uh, it is involved in all our lives, at least on all islands but uh, Kauai. Um, and we should be interested in its welfare and its future and its technology and its viability and all that. So where, you know, what, what is it poised to do right now? A well, quick point of clarification, Jay. Yes, I, I am one of the founders of Hawaii Island Electric, uh, Hawaii Island Utility Cooperative, uh, excuse me, Hawaii Island uh, Electric Cooperative, Electricity Cooperative, HIEC, but, but I'm not the CEO. That is, um, that's Richard, uh, my friend Richard Ha. So just one point of clarification. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm sorry, could you uh, repeat the question? 
um, wh where, where is it going? Whereas, you know, here we are uh, at, a, at a flex point, as you describe it. Uh, where is it going? I mean, and we, and we have, you know, this is very complicated because we have COVID going on and COVID affects everything, including the utility. Um, you know, and we have, we have the, the economic troubles that follow COVID like rack and pinion, there will be, there are economic troubles. There are people who can't pay the electric bill. Um, there are companies out of business and there will be more. Um, there's no sign this is going to slow down. In fact, is every sign is it's under the blanket now and the economic troubles in Hawaii will pop up. We were in um, CNBC yesterday for the extraordinary number of uh, the extraordinary increases in the number of infections in the state. So um, I guess uh, I'm asking where where all this goes. It's very complex. Uh, it's at a flex point now, and call it the management of HEI and Hawaiian Electric. But um, where does it go in terms of the relationship of the largest company in the state and arguably the most important company in the state as far as consumers and businesses are concerned um, and who we all you know we all need uh, and, and you styled the title the uh, hico two-step and new we had one question come from a a uh, somebody who saw that and she said new what is new <laughs> So, I, well, Marco will explain it to you. What he means? What do you mean? Yeah, I guess I'm uh, I'm showing uh, I'm being a little bit cute here by using the French word for us N O U S, which is pronounced new. Uh, so yes, H E I He Go and New and Us. So yeah, let me kind of whittle uh, whittle down to that. I mean, uh, you know, from Hawaiian Electric's perspective, uh, things uh, things I think are looking pretty good right now, especially compared to let's say last year. At this time, their stock price is trading at a very healthy mid forties dollar share. They peaked last year at a little over fifty momentarily, and then went down. So their market capitalization is, I believe, uh, makes them the most um, well wealthy, the most the highest market cap in the state of Hawaii. And they've also done a very good job uh, communicating. Uh, it would seem to to Wall Street analysts. And this has led, amongst other things, to a, an improved situation overall with their credit rating, with the three credit rating agencies of Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor. So that's always very, very important, of course, to a publicly traded company. They have, uh, shall I say, weathered the rollout uh, so far of performance-based regulation, PBR for short, which is going live this year. And I mean, I just read a blurb in uh, the advertiser today that we're, we in Hawaii are back up to, you know, 30,000 people coming into the state per day, which was kind of the metric, anything at 30,000 above was what we were seeing two years ago, 2019. So not to not to poo poo by any means, the numbers we're seeing in Hawaii now, which are astronomical in terms of COVID, both gross numbers, testing positive hospitalizations, and the hospital system being slammed like perhaps we've never seen it before. But you take a step back and at least Hawaiian Electric seems to have weathered these storms. And for now, at least Jay, for now, they, they seem to be looking pretty good, pretty good in terms of their vital signs, at least from what I can tell. You know, in the time when David Ige took a position against uh, liquid natural LNG um, and uh, also the, the merger with Nextera, um, and that was that was troubled times because they were both initiatives that Hawaiian Electric wanted to see happen. Um, and, uh, you know, then that, that big phantasmagoric hearing in Blaisdell Center over the next era acquisition was really extraordinary. And it was it was not good. It was not good. Not good for for uh, Hawaiian Electric. Not good as far as I'm concerned uh, for for energy in the state or for the people of the state. That's my own view. Um, but things seem to settle down, and Jay Griffin got to be, um, you know, the, the chair of the PUC, uh, and that seemed to be okay. Um, but I just wonder where that is going right now, because the relationship of the utility and the PUC is a, a critical element in um, in the credit rating of any utility in the country. 
on Wall Street for new money. Uh, how is that doing? Uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for Jay and Jenny and Leo, but that said, uh, I think Jay has made numerous public uh, pronouncements uh, or indicated at least that uh, you know he he sees it as a high priority not to not to the, for the commission to not do anything overtly uh, damaging to Hawaiian Electric in terms of their ability to to get access to capital at a reasonable rate. So I mean, and and I think you know they've been successful in doing that. So you know, where do we go from here? I mean, there's still uh, you know on the more granular level, there are multiple projects on all of their service territories uh, to either Huhonua here on this island or CBRE on Molokai and this lawsuit going on as we speak right now between uh, half, excuse me, Molokai New Energy Partners, AKA Half Moon Venture uh, for a seven megawatt solar facility uh, with 15 or so megawatt hours of storage on Molokai that lawsuit in, uh, in federal court between uh, Justice Michael Seabright. And then there are, you know, there's the big push on Oahu to not only get KES, Kapolei Energy System online, the, one of the biggest batteries that will be, battery with Tesla Megapacks, by the way, that will be deployed when it does go live to this new program since um, I was away for a number of weeks now that I'm back. This new program announced with, um, in a hurry, by the commission and by uh, Hawaiian Electric to essentially install 50 megawatts, that's 50 million watts of behind the meter solar and storage, actually storage capacity in the form of, uh, let's say Tesla power walls that will be able to be conceivably drawn on by HECO uh, from these individual sites, thousands of them on Oahu to be able to try to uh, make sure that there's an adequate reserve margin once the coal plant at AES or run by AES goes offline absolutely positively in 2022, September 2022. So, I mean, there's so many, there's so much going on, so many balls in the air, you know, energy wise and with Hawaiian Electric. And uh, that's, that's kind of my quick rundown on the ones that I typically have been following. What about the technology? What about community solar? Um, what about you know all these various solar projects that Hawaiian Electric is involved in, which we hear about from time to time? They're big projects. They're unprecedented projects. Um, doesn't what does that tell us uh, about the their advances in technology and in scope? Well, great question. I mean, the proof is going to be in the tapioca pudding, as I like to say, because uh, these uh, utility scale solar plus storage projects have not yet gone online. Uh, they are in various uh, stages of uh, permitting and or construction on Oahu, uh, this island and Maui. And the, the change, the big change now and in the years to come compared to X number of years ago is, is the storage aspect of it. I mean, KIUC, Dave Bissell and his crew have already been pioneering this on Kauai uh, these past years on a smaller scale because the Kauai uh, grid is a lot smaller than uh, Oahu, obviously, or Maui or the Big Island. So the, the batteries, both uh, these mega packs, whether from Tesla or whomever else, and behind the meter storage, whether from Tesla or whomever else. I mean, that's changing the face of grids. That's changing the whole architecture of grids or will, I should say, change it where it's gonna be truly more bi-directional where you'll be able to, the utility operator will be able to tap into storage that will be distributed across the service territory, sometimes as, as granularly as from home to home to home or neighborhood to neighborhood. So when you say, well, what's the technology? Uh, how is it different? What's it gonna do? I mean, we're, we're in the grand unfolding right now of that, Jay, in terms of seeing how it all works, translating it from paper and algorithms and spreadsheets and designs into how it works in the real world. Wow, <clears throat> that is very interesting because uh, we don't have that much longer to go to reach our target dates. Uh, and although I am definitely impressed with the progress 
in moving in those directions. And the whole notion of utility solar, which is, whose time is certainly coming, if it, even if it didn't come before. Um, I'm impressed. And the question really I put to you is all of that considered, are we, are, do you think, do you think we're on track here? Do you think we're going to make the uh, the state goal of 2045 or the one electric goal of 2040 um, to go 100 um, percent, you know, renewable? I'm a lot less comfortable about opining about something that may or may not happen in uh, 24 years or 19 years. I'm more kind of what's what's in front of me, what's in front of us right now. And let me kind of do a, a case in point. So, and you know, you and I have spoken many times over the years. I have a very uh, strong connection of fondness for Molokai. Goes back to my, my youth when I went fishing there as a kid with my father. And I'm particularly paying close attention to the rollout of what will be phase two or the second attempt, second RFP request for proposals for community-based renewable energy on Molokai. And keeping in contact with a number of, of the parties there is, you know, you've had Ali Andrews on and, and uh, Todd Yamashita. So they're certainly in as well as, a, as well a number of other parties. And it's, uh, it, it's now kind of the, the prelude, it's the foreplay to the RFP actually going live, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And it'll go live, I'm gonna guess sometime within the next 60 to 90 days, and then that's when the clock will start ticking for proposals to come in. So practically speaking, Jay, practically speaking, there are two possible solar projects with storage that would be welcome, I'll, I'll use that kind of in a guarded sense of quotation marks, that would be solicited by Maui Electric Company, Nico, for Molokai. One would be about a two and a half megawatt plant, and that would be most likely right by the one and only Nico power plant just west of Kanakakai, a place called Palaau, Palaau, okay, two and a half megawatts. And then there would be uh, conceivably a 250 kilowatt solar plus storage somewhere else on the Maui grid or somewhere else on the, on the Molokai grid. Uh, I've looked at the possibility of the rec center, the recreation center as a parking lot that could you could do a parking shade structure, for example, there, which is right by a, a Miko distribution line. So that would that's a possibility. So you have these two possible plants, right? Two and a half megs at Palaau, 250 at, at the rec center, hypothetically, right? And of course, uh, you can't do these projects unless you interconnect to the grid, right? That, that goes without saying. And there is a cost to interconnecting to the grid. It's called an interconnect fee or interconnect cost. And what we are seeing preliminarily, according to the documentation submitted by Hawaiian Electric Nico to the commission on these subjects, is that they are saying, they're proposing, they're noting all the above, that the cost to connect a two and a half megawatt plant at Pala Al could be, would be over $3 million, $3 million. Sounds and, high, will that, will that kill the project? Well, and I just, before I answer that, wanted to add as well that uh, a 250 kilowatt project there at the Kualapu Rec Center, again, hypothetically, could be an interconnection cost of over $700,000. So to your question, will it kill the project? Well, I mean, that remains to be seen. It remains to be seen whether the commission, whether Jay, Jenny, Leo, and the staff there will sign off on that or whether it could conceivably be passed on to rate payers where Miko would eat part or all of the cost and pass it on to the rate payers on Molokai, let's say writ large, as a way of not making that interconnect cost so so much of a burdensome possible poison pill. So, and, and it's not just Molokai, interconnect costs over the years have been a very big wild card that have scotched uh, no small number of projects on, on their service territory islands. And, you know, I don't wanna go down the path of, of ascribing, you know, malevolent or nefarious intent here, but at the same time, uh, you know, it kind of represents perhaps something of a tone deafness on the part of, you know, the, the utility company, because, I mean, 
and, and to the to the credit of the commission, they are talking about having an independent engineer, which I think makes a lot of sense. An independent en engineer ride herd essentially on these projects, these proposed projects. So it's what just, is it supposed to cover? What is the interconnect fee supposed to cover? Is it supposed to cover specific items, or it just throw it on the wall kind of number? I think that's something that our friends at Hawaiian Electric, whether it's uh, Big Jim Kelly or Peter Rossig or somebody else more more uh, informed to address rather than, uh, than okay, me. Well, let me let me let me go to the last point I wanted to raise with you, and that is this. So logistically, Marco, and you you travel, you read, you know about this, you think about this. Um, we, we're in climate change and climate change has a real edge on it, as we are seeing almost every day. We're seeing it in wildfires and floods and droughts. We're seeing it in storms. Um, and we will continue to see it because it grows. Whether the press decides to link a particular weather event to climate change, we all know that it's linked. Um, and certainly we here in Hawaii, although we're a small speck in the Pacific Ocean, we're in the path of extreme weather. We've had extreme weather before, before climate change, and we will have extreme weather in the future um, in climate change, and it will be more extreme. And it will happen between now, who knows when, any time, um, and the time we're supposed to meet our target goals. How will climate change and extreme weather and the other implications of climate change affect our ability to get to our um, targets? Oh boy, uh, what a question to, uh, to, 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 to ask. I think, uh, you know, I'm gonna kind of do a little uh, Marco jujitsu move on that and, uh, you know, ask rhetorically, practically, you know, how, what's the sense of urgency that uh, the venerable Hawaiian Electric feels at this point? to get these projects online. And again, I'll harken back to the CBRE program, which was passed by the legislature, signed into law six, more than six years ago, six years ago. And as of now, if I'm not mistaken, there are 298 total kilowatts, uh, uh, just two projects on Maui and Oahu under CBRE, six years later. And you know, finger pointing is kind of useless, but at the same time, uh, it does it not beg the question uh, in terms of urgency. And it's all well and good to legislate and have the governor sign this and that. But when it comes to when it comes to execution, when it comes to getting stuff online in a timely fashion, that's where there's a fair amount of grinding of teeth going on. And I mean, Jay Jay Griffin has been very public about that, you know, in these, some of these forums. So. It's uh, it doesn't do any good to you know necessarily to to point fingers and to blame, but at the same time, you know, we, we all feel or many of us feel the frustration here in terms of getting stuff online. So you now the, the the clock is ticking, obviously, and you know, and just kind of sidebar note, Jay, uh, I spent part of the past weeks driving from the Bay Area all the way up to the coast of the border with Canada, Bellingham, Washington, and especially south from Portland on I-5, I went through hundreds of miles of dry, desiccated landscape, hazy because of the fires. I drove over uh, what used to be Lake Shasta, this more kind of puddle Shasta now. I mean, I spent time at Shasta when I was a kid. Now it looks pretty much apocalyptic. And it's not just Shasta, I mean, it's Lake Powell in Arizona. I mean, it just goes across the board. So, I mean, comparatively speaking, we in Hawaii seem to be a little bit better off, but at the same time, you know, the next hurricane rolls around and knocks off the Miko grid or the Helco grid or the, uh, the Oahu grid, then maybe it's gonna get more of our attention collectively to get stuff done faster. I don't know, I mean, but there's a greater sense of urgency now to what extent the powers that be, uh, really feel that and are acting on it, that is what, that's, that's in the making. That's, that's, that's what we're witnessing. Okay, Marco, thank you very much for that um, elucidating discussion and a, a profound answer to my question. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Marco. We'll see you soon. Uh, we'll discuss other energy issues that come up in, here in Hawaii 808, uh, the cutting edge, energy 808, the cutting edge. Marco Mangelstorf, thank you so much. Hello. Hey, thanks so much, Jay. Always a pleasure. Good to be back with you, brother.